Welcome to Empowered by Iron, the podcast for female strength athletes by female strength athletes. We are your hosts, Dr. Kristen Lander from Fiercely Fueled Nutrition Coaching and Mary Morton, PhD candidate and weightlifter. Together, we are Empowered by Iron. Hey everyone, welcome to Empowered by Iron. This week we have a little bit of a different format for you. We're going to talk about three different things. The first thing that we're going to discuss is shoulder mobility. Then we're going to move into uh, muscle protein synthesis and how all the different macros that we take in and consume during the day, how that actually helps fuel muscle protein synthesis. And then finally, we're going to do a little update and discussion about uh, the body recomp that Kristen and I both are doing. So to start off this podcast, we are going to begin with shoulder mobility. And as you know, Kristen is the expert on this topic. So Kristen, take it away. All right. So shoulders, woohoo. Shoulders, I think, are like the most fickle joints in the body. Um, I think just about every athlete has had some issue with a shoulder at some point, whether it's just been a day or a week or a month or a year. Um, They are really complex joints. So we're going to break down some shoulder mobility for you guys um, and go a little bit into depth on some of that stuff. So um, this is the joint where we need a lot of mobility, but we also need a lot of stability, which makes it um, a little bit unique in terms of um, the way joints affect us as athletes. Uh, shoulder pain and injuries are super common in strength sports um, and CrossFit due to their complex nature. Um, and then our postural abnormalities and then Um, overuse in one plane, which I see happen a lot with weightlifters and powerlifters. So So you mean one plane, like in the jerk, if you are jerking overhead, that's, that's one plane overhead. Yep. So vertical, vertical, and then horizontal would be the other plane, like overhead press or jerking or something. Yeah. Bench would be horizontal bench and push ups, And then vertical would be anything overhead. So, so whether it's a press or a that, jerk or a snatch. Mm-hmm. So exercises that you're not using your full range of mobility in your shoulder. Correct. Yeah. Full in range in of all the planes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Got it. So I think that um, shoulders are to think of the shoulder as just one joint is really a gross underrepresentation of the shoulder. It's more like a complex that's made up of three joints. So we've got the glenohumeral joint, which is what everyone thinks of when they think of the shoulder. That's where your shoulder blade meets with your upper arm. Um, And then we have the scapulothoracic joint, which is um, the orientation between the rib cage and the shoulder blade. And then we can't leave out the AC joint, which is where your clavicle attaches to your shoulder blade. And that's, people know about that joint because whenever someone has a shoulder separation, that is um, the joint that is getting separated. So, right. Um, But before we go too far into shoulders, I want to talk about something else. What? Which is the thoracic spine. Oh, lame. So no, totally not (laughs) lame though. Um, We cannot talk about shoulders without talking about the thoracic spine. So the thoracic spine is basically the part of your torso that contains ribs, if you want to think of it that way. So it's um, basically if you do a high bar squat, where you place the barbell is basically the top of the thoracic spine and then all the way down to the bottom of your rib cage. So the part in the middle that's the spine, that's the thoracic spine. Um, a lot of tight shoulders are a lot of people that think that they have tight shoulders oftentimes also have a, uh, immobile thoracic spine. And, um, if, so we have to have about like 20 to 40 degrees of extension in the thoracic spine. So bending backwards, and I'm not including the, the movement that you get in your low back when you bend backwards. So just in that part of the spine. And most people don't even spend their day in neutral. Like we spend so much time 
hunched over a desk or a computer or our smartphones, um, that most people are spending their day in flexion, which is the exact opposite of extension. So we, we start to lose that ability to extend. Um, so if you are only working on your shoulder mobility and aren't addressing any thoracic spine work, that is going to cause you some problems because you can create some hypermobile shoulders, but then you never really get into the position that is necessary to do the movement that you're trying to do. So this is evidenced by people who, when they do a snatch or an overhead squat, um, in the bottom of that squat or that snatch, the bar will be behind their head head, but um, their torso is inclined forward. So if you looked at them without their arms, you would think it would look like they're doing a low bar back squat. So they're inclined forward a little bit. Um, but then when you see their arms, the, the bar is so far behind their head that it's almost balanced over their shoulder blades. And it should be balanced over like where your ponytail would meet with the back of your head that's the appropriate place for the bar. So um, when we see that, then those people are really cranking on their shoulders, but they don't have the thoracic spine extension to be in that position. So that's just opens you up for um, a lot of shoulder instability and a lot of shoulder injuries down the road. So not good. You don't want that. No. So basically you've got to work both. If you've got poor shoulder mobility, you've got to also work on your thoracic spine. So you're so, telling me that the body works as a system and not as individual parts? Exactly. <laughs> what is this? It, it's, isn't it weird? <laughs> so, it's so funny because it sounds so stupid to say that loud. You're like, oh, right, that makes sense. But when you think of it, when, when something hurts or something doesn't feel right, we don't really think of how it works as a system. We think of it as an individual piece Right. Which is a that, mm -hmm. like when, when I injured my lower back earlier this year, yeah, my back was hurting, but I needed to address my core. I needed to address my hips. I needed to address all the things that stabilize and were pulling on that back. Right. Which is, that's what drives me crazy when people go to their healthcare provider with um, jo a, a pain in a joint and that healthcare provider only looks at that joint. And it's probably not, whatever their problem was, it was probably, their pain is probably caused by something else. So yeah, you may have torn your rotator cuff, but why? Was it because your thoracic spine was so immobile that you couldn't get in the right position and now you know, you're know you creating an unstable joint to move around or? whatever. So it, it does. That happens a lot. People look at only the area where you have pain and you've got to look beyond where the pain is. Yep. So hopefully we can keep ourselves healthy and stay out of pain. But um, as athletes, I think it's just a, a lot of management because a lot of things come up. Yeah. So let's talk about how you know if you have bad shoulder mobility. So um, Poor shoulder mobility would be defined as um, the inability to raise your arms all the way over your head and have them line up with your ear and also keeping your rib cage tucked down. So not letting those ribs flare out and then not letting that low back extend. So if you can't get your arm in line with your ear while keeping a neutral spine and a neutral rib cage, probably have some shoulder mobility issues. Um, the other is the other tests that I like to look at for shoulder mobility is um, if you can reach with one arm behind your back and touch in between your shoulder blades, um, you should be able to get your hands close to symmetrical. Don't do it at the same time, but do your left arm and then do your right arm and see if you're only able to get like you know, to just just behind your back with your right arm, but your left arm can, you know, to almost touch your neck. That's we've got a little problem. Damn, the, the mobile shoulders. <laughs> yeah. And then um, and then the opposite. So reaching behind your head and over your back um, to touch your shoulder blades. So same thing. If you can almost get all the way down and touch your bra strap on one side and the other side, you can barely get your arm behind your head. That's another sign of some shoulder mobility problems. 
So um, you want them to be symmetrical or close to symmetrical and um, you want it to be pain free. So um, really, uh, I kind of talked about how spending too much time hunched over like we all do um, causes us to be in chronic thoracic spine flexion. Um, that causes our shoulders to roll forward. And when that happens over time, our pec muscles shorten. Um, and then that leads to the muscles of the upper back in between the shoulder blades lengthening and becoming unstable. And so we get a lot of muscle and tissue imbalance when we have shoulder, shoulder mobility problems, um, And so if you listen to our episode on mobility for the squat, you know that I'm a really big fan of stretching a muscle group and then activating the opposing muscles. And that's exactly why. What I just described is why. We get these these tissue imbalances and that's the best way to lock in some tissue changes. So an example would be if you want to, if you're gonna stretch your pecs, like do a doorway pec stretch, and then follow it up with some rows. And the reason is because you can't have two opposing muscles working at the same time. So if you stretch one muscle and then activate the other muscle, activate the opposite muscle, you can get a little bit longer lasting changes occurring. And over time, that really adds up. So the biggest thing I think as athletes that we need to do is to avoid overuse, right? I mean, that's just where, whether you're a power lifter or a crossfitter or a weightlifter, um, we tend to be doing a lot of the same movements over and over and over. And we've got to have ways to mitigate any sort of overuse injuries. And so if you are a power lifter and you're doing a lot of bench press, you're working a lot in the horizontal pressing plane, like Mary and I talked about in the beginning. Um, So you need to spend some time working in the vertical plane. So doing standing presses. Um, That is not that is not going to necessarily equate to strength gains, although it definitely could. But the reason you do this is so that you can continue to bench for years and years and years without having shoulder problems. So um, if you're a big horizontal presser, you've got to be spending some time doing vertical pressing. And then weightlifters, this one's a little bit controversial. Um, I know I'm going to get some flack for this and um, my coach and I actually um, see this differently in terms of me, my body. Um, But uh, my opinion is that we spend a lot of time as weightlifters working overhead and we do like no horizontal pressing, like weightlifters hardly ever bench, although some some definitely do um, Mm -hmm. and some really high level ones do. And um, I know that I know that there's people out there that worry that that bench pressing is going to make their shoulders too tight to snatch. And um, my opinion of that is, mm, yeah, it's going to make your shoulders a little bit tighter, but there's plenty of ways to mitigate that tightness. Um, And that I think that having shoulders that are strong in all planes is preferred. So work on do some bench or some push ups and then do shoulder stabilization exercises and stretches so that we can bulletproof our shoulders. Boom. Exactly. So the muscles that tend to be implicated in poor shoulder mobility in terms of tightness is going to be the pecs, um, pec major and pec minor, your lats, your teres minor, which is a teeny tiny little muscle at the back of your shoulder, um, biceps, and then like some posterior deltoid tightness. Re- basically, any any muscle in your in your upper body that connects to your shoulder at all can, if it's tight, it can cause some shoulder mobility issues. Your shoulders are quite the center of attachment, eh? <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a ridiculous amount of muscles that um, go into the shoulder complex, especially if you think of it from the three joints that I talked about in the beginning. It's it's a lot of <laughs> muscles. Um, so so you've got to work on some stretching or some soft tissue work um, to really 
work on those tight areas, but that's not enough. Um, as I talked about using the example of someone with poor thoracic spine uh, extension in the bottom of their snatch or their overhead squat, seeing that bar way behind their head, um, they're creating unstable shoulders. And so we have to also work on our shoulder stability. Um, this is a sp- especially important for any athlete that does overhead work. So weightlifters for sure, but it's also really important for benching too. I mean, you're loading yourself up with a lot of weight. You got to make sure that your shoulder stabilizers can handle that. Um, And so when I'm talking about shoulder stabilizers, a lot of people think like, okay, rotator cuff, like I need to just work my rotator cuff, internal and external rotation with a band. Like, yeah, that, that, that is definitely it. Um, but there's a lot more and a lot of muscles that are overlooked are the lower and middle trap, um, the serratus anterior, which is a fun little muscle that is um, kind of on the side in front of your rib cage. And if you ever see someone who's really, really lean and they're pressing weight overhead and it looks like they have like little fingers on their ribs, that's the serratus anterior. It's a really important muscle. Um, and then your rhomboids, which are um, in between your shoulder blades and the levator scapulae, which is up kind of near your trap. So um, those muscles all need to be really, really stable. Um, And there are like tons and tons of um, tutorials out there and articles. And this has been a hot topic for years and years and years um, uh, for athletes. And so literally all you would have to do to find some good exercises for shoulder stabilization and shoulder mobility is Google and you will find tons of really good stuff. But we're going to link some good stuff in the show notes to um, some of my favorite tutorials and things that are some things that are simple. And then if you're a nerd and like things to be really complex, um, I found <laughs> a few really complex things as well. So yeah, so that's our shoulder mobility is and shoulder health is pertinent to our success as an athlete and um, should definitely, definitely not be overlooked. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't just think that it's your shoulders that are the only issue. Look at your body as a whole and look at everything that attaches to your shoulders and take Kristen's advice and try to work on everything that could potentially be polling and try to diagnose what it is. Right. And you know what? One thing that I love seeing um, in the last several years, so many of the resources out there um, that you you type in like, okay, shoulder mobility exercises. And um, if it's a good resource, almost all of them will also talk about the thoracic spine. In fact, I've seen some that like don't even address the shoulders. It's like shoulder mobility. And then it's all about the thoracic spine, which is really great because it is so overlooked and it is so important. Um, Because basically, if you can't get your spine and your rib cage out of the way, you can't get weight over your head. It just, it's not going to work. Things get bound up. So you've got to be able to get your spine and your rib cage out of the way of those that scapula moving so yeah sounds good shoulder mobility if you guys have questions about shoulder mobility um or what you should be doing um you guys can always join our facebook group page which is uh women in strength athlete resource and come on in and ask some questions or post resources and ask us what we think um, we always love that kind of stuff so absolutely absolutely okay so now we're going to move into our next segment but before we do that i wanted to bring up one of our partners so empowered by iron is proud to partner with women's strength coalition Founder Shannon Wagner and her and her team of women is on a mission to build communities through increased access to strength training. To support Women's Strength Coalition, please use the link in the description below to make a tax deductible donation. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to be talking about is where do muscles come from? So we hear a lot about Nutrition, obviously, we talk a lot about on the podcast. There's a million articles a day written. Everyone on Instagram and Facebook is talking about 
how their macros are going and all this good stuff and how jacked they're getting and blah, blah, blah. Or how tiny they're getting. Or how tiny they're getting. Whatever, pick your poison, (laughs) whichever one you want to do. So something that both Kristen and I have noticed is while kind of like the shoulder thing, while we, we tend to talk about carbs and proteins and fats individually, it is not as common to see them talked about as a whole. Right. So how does each macronutrient work together in order to increase, in this case, muscle protein synthesis, which I'll add a disclaimer there, not every type of synthesis in your body is going to go straight to your muscles. So keep that in mind. Um, But today we wanted to take a step back and talk to you, not in boring detail of what enzyme actually puts muscle on in your muscles, what enzyme breaks down muscles. We're not going to talk about that, but we're going to take a step back and kind of look at the overarching interaction between these three different macronutrients. We won't even get into micronutrients because that's a whole new thing. Whole separate topic. Whole well, that's topic. when we start talking about enzymes and cofactors, and well, we that's really, to. really fun. Super, <laughs> super fun, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will fall asleep if we start talking about that. We can't Except that. for like five of you, but you guys are the true MVPs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get started. We all know that the macronutrients are fats, carbs, and protein. Fats are made up of triglycerides, which consist of three fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule. Your body either uses dietary fats as energy, which as you remember is slow digesting, digesting, so this is why we recommend you not eat them very close to training because your energy will be slower over time and not a burst like you need. Or your body stores dietary fat as adipose tissue or fat. Not directly, Remind, keep in mind that there's a process of it breaking it down and storing it, but that's kind of the overarching, it'll get stored in your adipose tissue or your fat. Um, fats are not stored directly, as I said. They are modified slightly prior to being deposited in the adipose tissue. The second macronutrient is carbohydrates, which if you remember from our carbs episode, are made of sugar. We, they are either in a complex formation or simple. So simple sugars, um, think of, I mean, basically sugar, you can think of cereals, you can think of um, Gatorades, or things that are are mostly made up of carbs. And then there's also complex carbohydrates, which would be like brown rice, or sweet potatoes, things that take a little bit longer to digest, but are still carbohydrates. The final one is protein. Protein is made up of amino acids. Protein can be obtained from many dietary sources, from meat to vegetables. Protein is broken down to its structural components, amino acids within the body. And those amino acids are what are used to build more proteins within your body. So now that we've kind of given, now that we've gone over the basics of each of them, How does each macro then contribute to protein synthesis? Start with fats. Fats, besides being a slow digesting energy source, largely largely contribute to hormone regulation in the body. As we've mentioned previously, a diet low in fat can lead to hormone dysregulation and proper hormone production is required for protein synthesis and normal organ function. Correct, Kristen? Correct. I love that you said normal organ function because that's something people don't think about a lot. Yes. Um, fats are vital. They are vital to our survival. And yeah. um, you, you're not going to make it very long on a low-fat diet. They are um, terrible for us. Especially women. So if we right. want... If we want our body to be primarily putting on muscle, we need to make sure that the rest of our body, the rest of our organs are functioning at their, not I don't want to say max capacity, but their optimal capacity. So that way your body's not 
using all these other resources to try to help make your organs work normally. Right, because there's a hierarchy of things right. that occur in the body. And if you are not, um, if your body's not working at optimal function, if something that is needed to keep you alive is not working properly, it, that all of that energy is not going to go to building muscle. This is why when people like get lost at sea and stuff, they get really small and their muscles just kind of deplete because their bodies using up the energy that would be going for um, muscle to do other things to keep them alive. So exactly. And once your muscles are kind of one of the last things your body will put on. Yes, because it's kind of an excess. In fact, if you are on a starvation diet, and you are in a prolonged starvation diet, your body will start eating your muscles in order to fuel the rest of your body. Yep. All right. So moving on to carbs. As we said, carbs are made of sugar and sugar, aka glucose, is our body's preferred fuel source. Why? Because in the body, glucose drives the production of what's called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And the ATP is the molecular driver of every chemical reaction in your body. From DNA repair to muscle protein synthesis, ATP is required to provide the energy for these normal processes. That being said, without carbs or on a low diet, low in carbohydrates, your body is forced to use other methods of energy, which are less efficient and less effective. One of these um, is uh, fermentation. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been on a low carb diet, you know the feeling of fatigue that comes with it. It's horrible and it's crippling. <laughs> It is. If, depending on depending on how, how extreme you're going, right? Right. We, we talk to some bodybuilders and when they're two weeks out or whatever, they can barely stay awake because they're on such a low carb diet. Correct. Terrible. Car and Awful. I never want to do that. I'm never no. doing that. Ah, no, not anymore. Never again. <laughs> never again. Plus, <laughs> plus, it's important for hormone function. Yes. And that's uh, exactly. So it, these all play together. Everything plays together. Yep. So carbs are good, but they too have their limitations. Carbs are not directly used to make muscle tissue. If that were the case, then we would, then we really would be made of sugar and we would actually melt in the rain. <laughs> I'm melting. Exactly. <laughs> um, one of our, ladies in the Facebook group had a great analogy for carbs. And she said, carbs are the gasoline for your car. If you have an empty tank, you won't get very far, which is, which is about as, as accurate as I can, as close to accurate as it, that can be, because without carbs, your body can't make this little molecular energy driver. And without that molecular energy driver, no reactions occur in your body. I loved that. I loved that analogy. It was great. Okay, now protein, the big one. Okay, now for obvious, this is the obvious one, protein. Protein kind of equals protein, right? Dietary protein is broken down to its amino acid components in the body, and those amino acids are distributed throughout the body and used for protein synthesis. Now, I cannot stress this enough. Protein synthesis does not equal muscle protein synthesis. Amino acids are used to build every freaking protein in your body from the functional proteins such as DNA repair enzymes, which I mentioned previously, to physical tissue like your skin and your organs and your muscles. Amino acids are the building blocks for every reaction in the body. Whereas carbs are the fuel Amino acids are the metal used to construct the engine, right? Yeah. You won't get far without the fuel, but you also won't have a car without the metal to construct the engine, the body, and the interior. It just wouldn't happen. But we're here to discuss muscle protein synthesis. So once dietary protein is broken down to its amino acid components, and those amino acids are shuttled to your muscles, the magic can happen, and it is here that those amino acids are used to construct and repair your damaged muscle tissue. So if we take this all together, as, as broad as this was, and I meant for it to be broad, 
Dietary fats are the oil, the washer fluid, and the coolant in your car. All vital, all if they run low, your engine will explode. <laughs> yep. Carbs are the gasoline, the energy for your car, and protein is the physical metal that makes up the car. You really can't have one without the other, but each has its own distinct role and doesn't really overlap with another role. You can't have fat being turned into muscle. You can't have carbs being turned into fat. And protein is not broken down into carbs. Right. Right. One thing I do also want to say is that, um, how, so carbs provide the fuel, the energy um, to drive the car, but they also... Um, are really vital to the repair process to yes. the recovery process so because of the energy um, absolutely because it takes energy for the protein to help repair your body yes so um you 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 really have to have both and atp if you think of it like a currency if atp in your body is like currency Every time you eat carbs, you're basically creating a savings account in your body. And every time your body needs to repair something, such as your muscles and build more muscles, it takes money out of that savings account, that ATP, and it it invests it in your muscles. And it uses that energy to take the protein and build your muscles. So the ATP, like I said, is the energy source for your body. Every reaction that happens in your body uses ATP. I hope. So we want lots of that. Yes. And I, I hope that that. Give me all the ATP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love a shirt that says that. Um, <laughs> Can someone make that for us, please? <laughs> if you guys have questions, you can ask them on our Facebook group page, just as Kristen said before. I hope that I did a decent job of breaking this down for you, but I really wanted to make it abundantly clear that each macronutrient has its own job and they all work together to create the full functioning system that is the body. And then on top of that, build the muscles that we all want. Yes. Well, and I think that that's really, um, this is why I am not a fan of any form of diet that cuts out one group completely. I just, I... They're all needed. Uh, yes, your body can create alternative pathways, but it's not efficient um, or desired. Right. So I, I should... want my body operating as efficiently as possible. Yep. So mm -hmm. you should never cut out eat any of the macronutrients. <laughs> no low carb diets, no low fat diets, no ketogenic diets. Keep it. Keep it equal. <laughs> Yeah, imbalance. It needs to be imbalanced. There's yeah, a, there's optimal the ratios, and every here's the thing: the, the individuality matters. So yes. some people will do better with higher fats than other. Um, some people will do better with higher carbs than another person. But um, but we're still not talking about like cutting out complete groups. No, right. no, just adjusting and balancing them that fits that individual person's needs. Well, this kind of leads us into the very last thing that we wanted to talk about. Yes, it does. Yes, which it does. is um, body recomposition. As you guys all probably know, or if you don't know, go check it out. Mary's doing a vlog because she recently switched over from being at a caloric deficit uh, to doing what I like to refer to as body recomposition. So she's eating... Um, basically at maintenance, but I hate that word because people think that that means that their body isn't going to change when they're eating maintenance macros and they're working out really hard. Um, and it does change. So she's uh, been chronicling her um, journey on her vlog. So go to YouTube and check it out. But um, she's going to give us a little update. And I have a few things that I want to talk about uh, regarding body composition. So. All right. Let's see. Going? So right now, I'm less than a week out from 
the Arnold AO Series 1. And I just dropped about a kilo in weight. So I was at sitting at about 67.3, 67.5. And I recently dropped down into the 66s. On accident. On accident. like there While was- eating lots and lots of food. <laughs> eating and except what was funny is actually the night before that I weighed in that morning I thought man I ate a lot tonight this seems absurd I probably should cut back and then I I dropped a kilo so I was like nope nope I don't know (laughs) we need to eat more food and Um, and just to be clear you are competing in the 69 kilo weight class so you are not trying to make weight you're not worried about your weight you're just simply trying to sit somewhere in your weight class which has been very easy for me to do, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. Actually, today I put on, I have these tiny little booty shorts that I have. I don't ever wear them because I never felt comfortable in them. And they never fit properly, even they were a large, which was like a hit to my ego, right? I was like, oh, I can't even fit in a large. But my body has changed so much over these past six weeks that I put them on today and they fit perfectly. Awesome. it was a little bit nuts. It is. A, it was one of those things. You're like, okay, this is this is working. But well, today, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, because you sent me. So if you guys saw the video or the picture that Mary posted in her last vlog about the um, the she had like um it was a like a before and during shot because it's not after because recomp is for life. Um, for life. But, but but immediately you didn't see the changes and you sent me the pictures and it was like. Oh, Holy crap, like, this is a huge change. You leaned out, you, you know, you lost a little bit, like, I think, like, was it like 0.3 kilo, like under half a kilo? Yeah, but Um, really, that was just a one day weighing. Yeah, yeah. It it really had been fluctuating about the same at that point. Sure. And so your body has changed a lot. And you didn't necessarily really notice it, which I think is is often the case. Um, We don't we still when we look at pictures of ourselves, I think we um, our eyes immediately go to like the one thing that we don't like that like maybe hasn't changed or whatever. Um, Or hasn't changed the way that we wanted it to. Right. And so I think that um, putting on clothing that you haven't worn in a while is such a powerful way to see those changes because you're like, oh, huh, these didn't fit me like six months ago. Yeah, they didn't fit me to the point that I would put them on and I'd start crying because I'd be like, oh, my God, why can't I fit into a large? Right. Sizes are stupid. Sizes are stupid. But then last night to continue eating more because I dropped a kilo, I decided last night to eat a lot of my favorite food group, which is peanut butter. (laughs) And today, which is Sunday, the 25th, I feel like shit. And I mentioned it to Kristen and Kristen said, you know, every time you mention to me that you've had peanut butter the night before or whatever, the next day you feel crappy. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. right. You had this, you, we've, t- we've been over this for like two oh, years. We talk about this, like your, um, your body creates excess inflammation when you have peanut butter. And so you, and your I fingers will swell up. They hurt, right? You don't feel good. My whole body, like my face felt swollen this morning. I was up a kilo which a kilo is a lot for me to be up in a day. Yeah. I was up and I just felt swollen and this may be TMI, but I have gone to the bathroom multiple times today, (laughs) which has not (laughs) been fun, but it just tells me that as much as I love peanut butter, I really need to cut it back a little bit and maybe just eat cereal instead. Right. So what I said to Mary when we were talking about this, um, and this was with love, I have to add, was body recomposition does not mean eat like an asshole. Right. Doesn't mean eat like an asshole, but just means I have to basically rethink, not rethink, but reapply what I already know. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Well, and that's the thing um, that leads into what I wanted to talk about is how to know when you're doing body recomposition. So what we're we're talking about eating at maintenance um, and sometimes for whatever reason, um, we might need a little bit more food. And so the way to know if you need more food is if you if your weight has dropped or if suddenly you're feeling really fatigued or really under recovered. Um, That means you're just not eating enough uh, for your activity level. So um, I think when that happens, the best thing to do is, I mean, yeah, you can just eat like a little bit more of everything. That's fine. Your body's going to use that up. Um, But in your case, the peanut butter maybe wasn't a good option for you because your body doesn't really deal with it well my body inflames when I eat too much peanut butter and I know this you know a year ago maybe a little over a year ago I remember the night before this is when I still kind of like binge eating the night before the last day that I overate a lot on peanut butter like last night was not bad I just had like six little tiny crackers of like peanut butter and jelly on them which is Mm. more which is about double what I normally eat because I usually only have three and then that's I call it so it was a little bit more, and I'm just learning that my body body is more sensitive than what I thought. Um, but I remember I ate, oh my God, it must have been like half a cup or more of peanut butter the night before. It was one of those just like standing in the closet, eating things, trying not to get caught because I still hadn't figured out how to moderate myself. Mm-hmm. And the next day I took Dixie, my puppy, for those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, that's my doggie. I took her on a walk and I just remember walking and feeling dizzy and lightheaded and I just felt every joint in my body hurt. And I remember thinking, that's it. I can't do that anymore. And that was just the the final moment of you can't eat eight cups of peanut butter a night. Like that's just, that's irresponsible. It's stupid. Right. Right. And I just, I forget, you know, we forget that we do that to ourselves and then this happens and it's just a reminder. Yeah. And I'm certainly not saying like, don't have treats or whatever, like certain definitely do that. Um, oh, so yeah, my, no. <laughs> what's that? I said, Oh, yeah, no, no, you still should have treats. Gotta have, Absolutely. You got to enjoy life and enjoy your food. Um, and, you know, there's a time and a place and you just have to be aware of how certain things affect you. Um, so I you guys, if you guys caught my announcement, uh, this past week, I've announced that I'm doing a powerlifting meet, my first powerlifting meet, and I'm I'm training powerlifting in with my weightlifting. Uh, and so this past week, I, I, I didn't change anything in my training, by the way. I mean, I was already doing this stuff. Um, I've just decided to compete. But um, this past week of training kind of beat me up a little bit, um, just in terms of the fatigue really started to set in yesterday. Um, I worked a little bit extra during the week um, than I normally do and whatever. So yesterday after training, I was absolutely dead. I mean, like got in bed on Saturday at 5 p.m. And I didn't get out of bed until this morning at like 8 <laughs> And I sat in bed and watched movies and ate some food. But uh, the thing that I recognized was my body is my body needs more food right now. I don't feel recovered. I feel I just everything hurt. My legs felt like cement. Um, so after seven by one at what ninety. 90- front squats. Yeah. Seven by one, which by the way, takes you guys ever do seven sets. I mean, and like take adequate rest in the middle. It takes forever, forever. I mean, I think I did my full clean and jerk max out and still beat you. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) I think so. And I wasn't like, you know, messing around. I mean, I set a timer in between my sets and I rested and then got up and did another. I felt like I was there for an entire day. Anyway, um, point is I said, all right, I need to you. So Mary and I take different approaches. She doesn't really count her macros. She doesn't really track her macros. She kind of has an idea of how much food she eats. I track my macros um, because I just am a numbers person and I'm a data person and that's just how it works for me. So I numbers make me anxious. Right, right. Not having numbers makes me anxious. Like, I don't know how much food did I I eat because I want to know what worked and what didn't work. So um, I I gauge by the entire box. (laughs) 
well, that's what that, that's what works for you. Um, so I ate an extra hundred grams of carbs on top of what I already eat, like for my maintenance carbs. So that was a lot. That was a lot of food extra for me. Um, I did have a little bit extra fat too, like only, I think it was only like five grams, but anyhow, um, that was, that was the ticket for me. I woke up this morning feeling awesome. I feel recovered. I feel like I could go train if I had to, but it's a rest day, so I won't. Um, and so that, that is how you know if you need more food is if you're feeling like that. Um, if you're feeling terrible and awful. Um, and if you are doing body recomposition, um, you can do that, right? If I was on a cut, I couldn't do that. I would just have to like shut up about it and just deal with it. But um, not, not, not all about the cutting life. So I am, um, I ate more food. Oh, and then the magic of it, I was down a pound today. That's where it, see, I was up a <laughs> kilo. <laughs> which is 2.2 pounds. So like right. Kristen's approach is better. Well, it's just what worked for me. And this is why, you know, I have, I've tracked my macros for so long that I knew like my problem it right now is recovery. The thing that's going to help me recover the most right now is carbs. Um, because I, I have plenty of protein in my diet. I don't think that eating any more protein was going to do a whole heck of a lot for me. It was definitely a carb issue. So that's what I ate and I feel amazing. I had um, I had um gluten free Cinnabunnies. Do you guys ever have oh, that cereal? Oh my god, that sounds amazing! It was really really good. I just sat in bed and just ate it like it was not with milk or anything. Just ate it. It was delicious. I love cereal. Yeah. Anyway, All right. so yeah, that's, that's body recomposition, basically. So for those of you that are still like not sure about this, um, check out Mary's vlog. Like both of us, you know, I don't I don't um, vlog about it because I've just been doing it for a while. And, um, you know, but I'm still leaning out like every day I'm or every week I'm a little leaner. Um, Mary's definitely leaning out. Um, so I have is... veins in my bicep. What? And and like prominent veins all the time in my arms now, which I've I only had when I was like anorexically thin. Okay, which you're definitely not now. No. You're looking healthy and muscular Thick. and strong and Thick. Yeah, your training's going well ish. We had a um, little bit of a meltdown the other day, but <laughs> this is what happens before every meet, so I'm fine. But I'll talk about that more in the vlog. All right. You guys make sure to check it out. You release those on Tuesdays. Tuesdays. Okay. Yes. And if you're going to be at the Arnold, um, we're having a meetup. So go join our Facebook group page and get the details on that. I don't think we've picked a place yet, but we have a time Saturday sometime in the morning. I forget I when. But like 9 a.m. I think. Yeah. 9 a.m. for coffee and donuts. And then we'll walk over to the Arnold together. So we hope we would love to meet you. We'd love to see you there. Um, for any of you who care, I'll be lifting Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the blue platform, I think. It's live streamed. I don't recommend you watching me because um, it's not going to be that exceptional. But it's the 69D section. At the same time, I'm lifting is the 63A session, and that's going to be great. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, thank you so much for listening this week, guys. And we can't wait to talk to you soon.